I don't know where this came from. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand what this is all about. There and back again. Okay, whatever. <laughs> I get these slides from various places, and that one's stuck in there, and I don't know. Ken will put that in. I have no idea who the heck J.R.R. Cooch is. <laughs> anyway, the history behind the multi-state. Uh, Neil Arneson, this guy right here, was a professor at the University of Manitoba for years up in Winnipeg. And he, he kind of, in fact, he developed some of the earliest software to do capture recapture estimation. He had a program called um, Top An. The program was called Top An. Clear back in the 70s, it ran on an IBM mainframe. And it was a really fancy piece of software. Um, you guys don't even know what IBM mainframes are, so we won't worry about it. <laughs> and then his student, uh, uh, Carl Shores came along and extended a bunch of this stuff and published some papers. Carl works up at uh, uh, Simon Fraser. Is he at Simon Fraser? Yeah, I believe so. Up in Canada. He does a lot of work on salmon, salmon escapement. He's a fish person. Some of you may have, well, if you do salmon work, you'd encounter his name per periodically. Uh, so these papers by Arneson and Arneson Shores. Then Brownie et al., there's Cavell Brownie down here. She came along mainly because of Jim Nichols. And that picture's fake, by the way, but that's Nichols. <laughs> uh, Nichols, is, he just retired a couple, well, a year ago, two years ago, two years ago. Uh, uh, that came about because of this Hespec Canada Goose thing that we're going to talk about. Um, some of you may know Jay Hespec. Um, he was director up at Jamestown for a while, I believe. Didn't do too well. They didn't like him very much. <laughs> didn't get along with the troops. But anyway, uh, they had a, we were going to talk about a Canada Goose issue. And so Cabell was called in to help develop this multi-state model for that. And so then things have gone on along, but Nichols was sort of the one that said, hey, there's got to be some new software, new, not software, but new theory developed here to make this work. So, um, so that's kind of the, the people that are in the background here. Uh, I'm not going to worry about this slide because nobody in here is into hidden Markov processes. If you're into the e-surge way of thinking about this stuff, that slide's critical. But since we're not in the e-surge version, we're not going to worry about it. Just think about it this way. We've got two states, A and B. And you can think about these as breeders and non-breeders or um, healthy and not so healthy. You've got some category, maybe condition index, where they it could be continuous, but you sort of slice it down the middle and say everybody that's that's uh, above this value is healthy, and everybody below that's not so healthy. Uh, you can define these states any way you want. But, you, but you've got to be able to determine, at this point, you've got to be able to determine the state of the animal when you detect it, when you catch it, when you see it. So breeder, non-breeders, what else? Uh, site A, Site B. Yeah, I mean, you, it's just, this thing's a chameleon. Uh, no, because those are very determined. Well, you can have them that way, but it's deterministic. They would go with probability one from being a juvenile to an adult. So, but life stages that aren't deterministic, they may be sequential. They can't ever go backwards, but they, you know, um, uh, frog, you know, I don't want to get into it too far here, but you've got different life stages where you can see these transitions, and they, they may take multiple occasions to do that. So that could be life stages, but not age per se. Uh, so A and B. So now let's go to this little chart first, and then we'll come back to this. We're released in state B. You can either survive with probability SB with the B superscript, meaning that it's survival rate associated with being in state B. And if you survive through the next interval, then you have some transition probability, psi. And you can either stay in B, so it's psi BB means you stayed in B, or you can say psi BA 
in which case you transition into state A. <coughs> so now, let's just go down this chain. If you're in A, you go into A, now you're either captured with A or not captured with A, B A. Okay? And so because you were released in B and you got captured here in A, you get a B A in your encounter history. So all of a sudden, our encounter histories are no longer zeros and ones. They're going to be zeros, A's, and B's. And likewise, if you stay in B and you get captured in B, you get a BB. Or if you're not captured, you get a B0. And just flip everything over and you have the A's. And you've got animals you released in A and you can see all the same stuff, OK? So two key points about this. One is if you're in state whatever state you're in right now, that's your survival rate until the next interval when we're going to sample. Just before we sample, you can transition. That's the only time the transitions can occur in this model. Why is that? Because if they occur during the interval and you go from A to B, your survival rate now becomes a mixture of A and B. <coughs> and so if you have transitions that are just willy-nilly, then your survival rates are not going to be be identifiable. Make sense? So breeding, non-breeding is a classic case. I mean, you, you transition into the breeding state. Well, the albatrosses. Let's go back to the albatross and keep the example simple. Albatrosses breed on the island. We go out and we sample the island and we detect animals on the island. They transitioned into that breeding state just before we started sampling, before they came in, when they started breeding. And, and so they were either previously in a non-breeding or a breeding state before they came to the island. So, so you don't have to sample both states. You don't have to sample both states. You're not sampling the non-breeding. Well, in the albatross case, we're not. That's an unobservable state. But it'd be nice if you could, because you can do a lot better. Unobservable states cause problems, which you're going to see. But we'll get around it. But no, if you can. Um, the, the case of the Canada geese that we're going to talk about, they sample them in all three wintering areas. And so they know a goose wintered on wintering area A in the beginning, and it was last year, and this year it's on B. We know it because <coughs> we caught it on B. And th this example shows that we're catching them on both A and B. Yeah. So the parameters in, go back this chart, we've got a if you stay in A, you go through a survival rate in A, and then you have to have a psi AA to stay, OK, around that loop. Otherwise, if you survive with A, you could go to B, take that route. If you're over in B, you can stay in B. You've got to survive with survival B and stay in B. Or you can survive with B and go to A at the end. But you survive with B. That's the point. And so, I mean, that's what's inherent in that little diagram is that the transitions occur after survival. You survive, and then you transition. You transition at the end of the interval. So signs are the probability of staying in that state or going to the other state. Right. Yeah. So psi AA is the probability of staying in A. Psi BA is the probability <coughs> of going from B to A, A to B. B, B. Yeah. What if there's like an irreversible transition? You fix it to zero. OK. Just for the reverse? Yeah. Okay. For that particular model, if that, well, I mean, uh, for the example of, of these state, stages of life stages where you kind of transition along, you can never go backwards. So you, just, you fix all the transitions going backwards to zero. Yeah. This might be along those same lines, but if you have uh, an animal like, say, a Chinook salmon, where you have the two different life states, mature and not mature, uh -huh. breeding, not breeding, but then they immediately die after breeding, can you make, can you put something like that in a model like that? Sure. Um, yeah, your transition, well, you would have a transition. I'd have to think of exactly how you want to do it, but you probably have a transition out of breeding state into the next state, which would automatically have a survival rate of zero, mm -hmm. would be one way. 
let's not get confused yet, but <laughs> and these, these size can, well, I don't want to go there. Yet. We'll, we'll, the, the chameleon part of this thing is you can do some weird stuff with all this, with the size. I don't want to get into that yet. You're just trying to get your head around it. Other questions? We'll keep going. I think some other examples make it a little clearer. Okay, so here's some example capture histories or counter histories. All right, so a couple key points. Survival depends on where you start. Transitions depend on where you start. Capture probability depends on where you end up. Okay, let's look at our geese. This was what prompted this whole, the start of this stuff was this Hespec study done and they published it in 91, but they had three, three Canada goose wintering areas, the Mid-Atlantic, the Chesapeake, and the Carolinas. And they were interested in how often geese transition between different winter areas. And they knew they did because they had neck collars on them, I think. I think that's how they did the study. I guess I don't know that for sure. And so you've got three states, i.e. three different wintering areas, and every year you go sample the winning area. Well, they had to transition onto that winning area just before you went out and sampled because they couldn't. So anyway, it meets all the assumptions. And so there you can see all the possible transitions. Okay? Here's what your PIM chart looks like. You got three S's, three P's, and if you look at the size, up the side, you realize that there are some that are missing. How come? Because the size have to sum to one. <coughs> Given that you survived, you've either got to stay or go or go to one of the other places. So they sum to one. So you only need to estimate two, and you get the third one by subtraction in this case. So in this example up here, uh, where did my cursor go? We've got psi AB and psi AC. Psi AA is gotten by subtraction. Same thing, BA and BC, BB is gotten by subtraction, and CC is gotten by subtraction. We're going to be able to change these, but which one's gotten by subtraction, that's one of the tricky parts about all this stuff. But um, particularly because sometimes you have to fix that one to zero. The probability of staying home is zero, so they have to go somewhere. Yeah? So this example survival is basically just depending on what year you're at what site. Yep. It's not yeah, and you might think that survival, well, maybe it's a lousy wintering area, and so therefore your survival the next year wasn't that good. Is there any way to look at like frequency of changing sites and that type of survival? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you I mean you've got given that you're in this state, there's your survival rate for that coming year. So if, there, if one of the winning areas was not as good, that survival rate should be lower. So let's suppose, let's go back to the diagram. Let's suppose that uh, anybody here from Carolinas, all the hillbillies down there are shooting them. <laughs> <laughs> they have lousy survival. Well, you'd expect S sub C to be low, right? And so, I mean, you're getting those, you're getting those differences. If, if the wintering area is, has some impact on survival, you're going to see that effect because, again, survival is a function of the wintering area they were on. Yeah. Other questions? You said that states can't be ages, is that right? Well, it's deterministic, and you could force it. I mean, they just always have to transition. So it, it would work. It just it doesn't make quite as much sense. but. Um, it, I mean, you could think of the uh, sage grouse data the other day from juveniles to adults. You could think of that as a multi-state model where they were forced to go into the adult state. So they can't. But it's strictly deterministic. The parameter would no longer be estimated. You just fix the transition from juvenile to adult, that side would be one. The probability of remaining a juvenile would be zero. So it worked. <coughs> Yeah, the questions. Do these models have any connection to like matrix models, like the age and stage models? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, no. It's not the. They can be spatial, like this. And, and those models are 
or like it's sort of related to them, yeah, but they're not. Uh, yeah, they can be. You could configure them like that. Yeah. All right. So would your age and sets classes be groups within this? No. Your age classes would be states. Even though your location is a state as well. Even though what now? The Even though the, the wintering locations are states as well. Maybe I misinterpreted your first part. What was the first part of the question? I was question? just trying to think about how you would do this with Canada East where you have, you know, different survival rates by age class. Oh. Um, you just run it for each age class? Or no, you would have you would have an age times area state. So, I mean, that would be the probably the way to do it. Yeah, you'd have a whole bunch of states, but you would fix a bunch of them. Yeah, I'm just trying to think with that. Well, I don't know. You could do it a couple different ways, but um, you could do it by group too, I think, because again, it's deterministic. If they're juvenile this year, they've got to be an adult next year. And so you could have a group effect like that where you forced it and then otherwise you had a lot of common parameters. You could do it like I sort of said that you could have a state by age, state star age kind of a state. Mm -hmm. so it could be six states. You got juvenile Carolinas and adult Carolinas. Right. And they have to transition. Um, you get the same results. You do it either way. Yeah. Okay, here's what your PIMs look like. We looked at those, I guess, already. Added complexity, more parameters than general model. Um, yeah, they get big. <laughs> you get a lot of parameters in a hurry with these guys. But again, a lot of times you can fix some of them to zero. I'll show you some tricks on how to do that. Uh, transition probabilities for a given state must sum to one, right? So we use a multinomial logit transformation, and I'll show you how that works in just a second. You got a much higher chance of local minima. Now, what's that all about? Well, all the models we've worked on so far, I think, I, I, could, I guess I can't swear that this is honestly God's truth, but, but they've got, a, they've got a, a one hump likelihood, or a negative two log likelihood. It goes up and comes down. But you get a situation, aha, You can get a sit. Oh boy, let's get another page. Ah. Where'd my? Okay, so you got your you got your parameter space uh, p goes from zero to one p hat. And you got your negative two log L. And so it goes up and comes down. Well, you can get situations where it goes up and comes down and comes up and comes down. And these are what this peak right here is a maximum, but it's a local maximum, a local optimum. And the true value of P is over here. And what happens with these models is you can get situations like that. It's because they're mixture models. They're mixtures of parameters. Just like we had the pledger models actually can have this kind of thing happen. Not very commonly the pledger models because you only have two mixtures. But in these guys, you can have multiple mixtures. Like if you have three states, you've got a mixture of three different things going on out there. And you can get this kind of stuff going on. So we have a, a trick called simulated annealing that built into Mark that will, <laughs> it, it's inefficient in a way, but it's also kind of cool. It, it, you'll get to a spot like this with the simulated annealing algorithm, and then it'll just throw everybody off at random and start all over again. And the idea being is that we're going to try to, to find this peak. And so it's just a computer way of, of restarting the algorithm with different starting values and seeing if we can find a, a better optimum or a, a, a bigger max. And uh, um, so 
it takes usually about 10 times longer to run. But what happens, what you want to do is if you've got a big multi-state problem and things aren't, you get a couple models that are looking pretty good and at the top and they seem to be working, it's always a good idea to, to run them with a the simulated annealing just to make sure that you're finding all the, the right optima. It, it, it happens with three or more, I think. I don't, I don't think I've ever really seen it happen with only two, but, but I've got a cool little example that I could show you that, that uh, somebody whose name I forget now thought up. But it, it, it just, it's clearly too optimum, and it, you just never know where you're going to end up. Simulate annealing will generally fix that. So anyway, that's just a warning. It's not that big a deal. I, I shouldn't make such a big deal out of it because it doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. Okay, and then the, the last point is, shouldn't be any surprise to you. You can't estimate the last S's or size or P's without constraints. All this is is a CJS model put into multiple states. So you got all the same issues there. I'll put the slides back up. Ah. There you go. Uh, There we go. Yeah, so, so we can't estimate the last S's and size P's without constraints. Shouldn't be a surprise. But if we robustify it, which we're going to do, then you can. Because you get the last P's, and there you go. OK, how about this multinomial logit? Um, if you've got. Psi BA and Psi BC, then you've got a Psi BB down here also. Well, you only need two parameters to model the three because you're getting the last one by subtraction. And so we have this multinomial logit. So instead of, of being like you think of a logit, it would be take this out, it would be E of B1 over 1 plus E of B1, right? But now we've stuck in the B2, and down here we've got a B2. And then there's a third one that that if you want to write out psi BB, it's going to be 1 over 1 plus EB1, EB2. So this is just a numerical trick to get, to force these three psi's to sum to 1. All right, so how do you specify that in Mark? You have to actually tell Mark which ones you want to sum to 1. So that's what this is all about. This is, we've got time-specific psi BA, BA, BA. There's three of them. We had four primary occasions. We're going to have three secondaries. So we're going to specify this as M log at 4, 5, and 6 as a parameter-specific. And I'll show you how to do that. Then we turn around and we do down here, we have to do it all over again, 4, 5, and 6, because we want psi BA and psi BC both to be M log at 4. And we want psi uh, for the second occasion, BA, BC to be 5 because that's the second set of psi's. We'll, we'll walk you through that in the mark. This just shows you what's going on there. Multi-state model assumptions. Within state, age, sex, all animals equally likely to survive. Move. In other words, there's no parameter heterogeneity. We're assuming all animals operate the same, like every other model we've done so far. Survival of the function of the state of origin captures the state of where they end up. Marks don't affect survival or movement. Yeah, okay. Animals act independently with respect to survival, movement, detection. Yeah, animals always have to be independent in these models. State is correctly assigned each time. That can get to be a little bit problematic, and we actually have models where we don't know the state of an animal when we catch it. Uh, and then each state is observable. Uh, we're going to violate that assumption right away when we go to this multiple robust design. So all these things can be extended with more complex models. Because the next thing is multi-state.